My name is Peter Dolan. I'm the Trail Program Manager for the Trail Conference. And thanks to everybody for joining tonight. This is a topic that is very near and dear to my heart since we've um, had a few what I think are really great successes with the Trail Conference, looking at historic trail networks and helping to shape improvements that have markedly improved experiences and reduced lost hikers. And we're actually in the middle of some planning that we hope to unveil this coming year. And even in the, uh, the age of social isolation and independent work, these are the kind of projects that we can still make progress on and even implement with solo volunteers. So I don't think that any of the challenges we're currently facing will stop us from making good progress. So this presentation we call Old Trails, New Systems, Reimagining Existing Trail Networks. And you can see while I'm presenting alone tonight on the bottom, this presentation was officially uh, given uh, in conjunction with New Jersey Division of Parks and Forestry. I presented at the International Trail Symposium last year with Joshua Osowski, who is the Northern Regional Office State Park Superintendent. And it was really powerful having not just the volunteer group represented in presenting this idea, but a formal park manager who could really stand up there and attest that these improvements and these ideas we're describing have had big changes on the ground that the park partners support. So to introduce everyone, you know, maybe you're new to the trail conference. I know these webinars have been getting a lot of people to engage with us for the first time. So for those who are new, since 1920, the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference has partnered with land managers to create, protect, and promote a network of over 2,150 miles of public trails in the New York City metro area. We recruit and organize volunteers to keep these trails open, safe, and enjoyable for the public. And a lot of people first encounter us through the maps and books that we publish for people to use. And my job as trail program manager is to make sure that our staff, particularly the program coordinators, are doing everything they can to support volunteers. So getting them materials, funding, technical support, whatever they need to be good stewards of the land and work with our park partners. And the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection was born in 1970 and it helped consolidate a bunch of New Jersey's past programs into a unified agency to administer environmental protection and conservation efforts. And you, you'll see throughout this presentation in the upper right of the screen, there's the Parks and Forestry badge. In the original presentation, these were slides that our, our partner from DEP would be presenting, but I'll be standing in for him tonight. And in this particular presentation, over the next hour or so, we're gonna cover first the rationale and inspiration behind changing trail networks. Uh, I think a lot of people say, if it's lasted for 50 years in this form, why would we change it? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. But we'll explain kind of, you know, what situations would bring us to look at these changes. Next is an example of our first concerted effort to improve a troublesome trail network. Uh, the lessons we learned from that project, how these lessons have been applied to latest projects and our upcoming future ones, how to overcome obstacles and changing trails. Not everybody wants to see change, even when most people agree it's good. So we'll talk about how to address those challenges. And finally, have time for everyone to add, ask some questions and get some answers. So hopefully we'll get through the, you know, more of my top-down presentation pretty quickly, and then any questions we can field as a group. So first, why change a trail network? A trail network, for those who haven't heard that term, it's composed of first what we call linear or some people call out and back trails. So this is a trail where you park, which is what the P is going to indicate in this presentation, a parking area. You park, you follow the trail, you get to a destination marked by the star, and then you go back. And that's it. That's a linear trail. Then we've got loop trails. Some people call these balloons or lollipops. With Sometimes they have a stem that connects them, which you can see. And then a trail network is any combination of those two styles of trail. So uh, regionally across the country, trail markings have different names. At the trail conference, we refer to them pretty uniformly as trail blazes. So a network is just the combination of a bunch of different uh, permutations of linear and loop trails. Next is why change it specifically when something on the ground is working. And many of the trails that we use today were designed back when peak bagging was the big thing. That meant hikers would go out, they'd go straight to the top of a mountain, feel good about themselves and go straight back down. And this would cover a lot of mileage. Often they'd go linear, so they'd go out, they'd hit the top, they'd come back. And they often took the most direct route up and down slopes. Sometimes those were old stream beds or logging roads, things that aren't necessarily sustainable. So the map that you can see here, the red dotted line represents an old style kind of peak bagging fall line trail where it goes straight up the contour map, 
each of those green lines is a, a contour interval, goes up to the top and then right back down. Modern trail design, we've learned that a trail like Trail A doesn't hold up very well. Water tends to run straight down it. And I'm sure everybody here who's a regular hiker has at least once gone up a trail that was straight up a mountainside and it was loose, rolling rocks underfoot, you know, maybe water's flowing down the middle of the trail and they're not very pleasant and they're not good for the environment. So increasingly we're looking at building new trails or converting old trails to more sustainable trails like B, the blue dotted line here. And you can see it starts at the same spot, ends at the same spot, gets you to the same place, takes a little longer, but it's much less steep. It follows the contour lines and the end result is more sustainable. So trail builders have learned a great deal about sustainably rerouting old trails to rectify these design problems in the past few decades. And in this presentation, I propose that trail networks, not just individual trails, are also sometimes outdated and they're a design problem that we need to investigate new solutions for. So whereas before we were kind of, you know, looking at the trees, now we look at the forest, zoom out and have big picture improvements for trail networks. So here's an example. Some of you might have hiked. This is in New Jersey along the Palisades in Rockley Woods. And over time, trail networks like this one usually build towards points of interest. So starting at access points, going to destinations, viewpoints and vistas, and they grow organically. They, they're not necessarily planned from scratch to begin with, they just grow over the years. And that kind of organic growth can be fine when the trail network is small and contained like this one. You can see on that map, it's kind of a green block. The green block ends and no matter where you are in that trail network, you're not gonna get too far from the parking lot. So it's okay if it's a little confusing. But a lot of our trails don't exist in tiny little plots of land. These trails connect large open spaces with lots of miles. So here's kind of a more typical North Jersey trail network. Um, this is Ramapo Mountain, so probably five minutes down the road, 10 minutes from the trail conference headquarters. Um, we call these often spaghetti bowls. It looks like someone just took a bunch of noodles, threw them at the wall and whatever stuck, that's your trail network. There's a lot of intersecting woods roads, which in this map are those black dotted lines or unmaintained trails, which are the red dotted lines. And on the ground, that can be very confusing because sometimes those black dotted lines, the woods roads are easier to see than the formal trail. And sometimes those red dotted lines, the unmarked trails look just as well maintained as the official ones. So if people don't have maps, they're just gonna follow whatever looks good to them and they can get very lost. There's also a lot of short linear connector trails. So if you look up near the P in the middle top of the screen, you can see there's a tiny little white red marked WR connector trail. Above that, there's a small P1 to the Tamarack Trail by Lake Tamarack. And these short linear connectors when people are hiking can be very confusing because you're on one color for a bit then it ends and you're on a new color and you kind of lose track of where you are. There's lots of different colors on trail conference maps. If you're not familiar, each letter represents a color. So O is orange, B is blue, Y is yellow, etc. And many hikers, as much as we want to believe that people are prepared, that they stop at kiosks, that they bring maps, most of the people I've bumped into here who are hiking don't have maps and they're lost. So we want to move away from having this idealistic, everyone should carry maps towards a more realistic, what can we expect of people? And to make things even worse, let's zoom out from this confusing little trail map. So that's Ramapo Mountain. You zoom out, you can see it's part of a much bigger, just as confusing trail network heading up towards Ringwood. That goes over towards Long Pond Ironworks, down to Northern Green. And if you keep going, you'll hit Wawayanda and um, Abram S. Hewitt, a few other parks. And yes, these are all connected. You could start on the right side of the map and walk all the way to the left corner of the map without leaving a formal marked trail. So no road walks, no man-made barriers where a trail ends. You could hike this entire picture, it's all connected. So you can imagine how lost people get if they're exploring without a map here. And the other thing we kind of alluded to a minute ago was the change in hiker demographics lately. And these large networks can be confusing for even experienced hikers, uh, but let alone new hikers who are coming out for a first experience and they encounter a trail network like this one. As hiking grows in popularity, we see more and more ex inexperienced people exploring the outdoors without adequate equipment. So no maps, let alone compasses. They often have their phone, maybe they've downloaded all trails or they have a screenshot of something and that's it at best. And one thing that I've heard over and over again, more times than I can count, is the assumption that hikes are loose. So this quote, I followed the yellow trail, but it never came back to the parking lot. is something that I hear constantly from everybody who's ever been lost 
it's because they picked a color, walked it, and when it ended somewhere different, they were baffled and lost. So historically, the answer to this has always been, well, let's improve maps. Let's get better maps online. Let's get websites with maps. Let's get map apps. And that is definitely part of the solution. We always want to be striving to improve what maps are available. But this only works if people find the maps, if they bring maps with them, if they know how to read maps, they can understand what it is that they're looking at when they read the map. And that's a lot of assumptions. And I, my background is animal behavior, and I always bring this up here because our problem is one of people have the tools, you know, maps exist, website maps exist, but people aren't bringing them with them. And if the solution is let's bring, let's, you know, invent more things for them not to bring, that's not going to solve the problem. You're not addressing the behavior that's leading to the challenge. So then the next thing people say is what about signage? We'll put up new signs and then people will never get lost. And that only works if first you can afford the signs. Signs aren't free, park budgets often, you know, they're limited to what they can afford. Nobody vandalizes them. You can see here, this is a sign that we put up that was only up for, I don't know, probably two weeks before it was snapped in half. And while we switched to more durable materials and metal backings after that incident, it shows that if in two weeks this beautiful sign is destroyed, you know, things only last as long as they are before people tear them down. People need to see the signs. Lots of people are walking and they're so stuck on you know, looking at their footing that they walk right by directional signs. When they see them, they have to stop to read them and process them. And that's also a lot of assumptions. So this presentation focuses almost exclusively on trailed blazes. And on the right, I wanna show that not as an example of good blazing, but that is an example of very confusing, poor blazing. You can see there is a blue trail turning left above a blue trail going straight ahead above a gray trail, above a, I guess, green teal trail turning left. And this was in Stoke State Forest before it was improved. But the good thing about changing blaze colors is that it's cheap. It's very easy to do. It produces an intuitive result. So even if all a person knows is, I want to hike yellow, I follow yellow, that's all they need to know, and the blazes should take care of them. So of course, again, good maps and signs should be encouraged, but once hikers begin walking, really blazing is the best way to keep them on track. So in summary, our ultimate goal through this presentation and the things we discuss here is to change trail networks to minimize lost hikers. And ultimately that can improve the hiking experience or in the most extreme circumstances, save lives. We have had people you know, have issues with exposure, getting lost, falling off cliffs, and we wanna keep them on trails for safety as well as convenience. So the inspiration for this came from a trail called the Blue Mountain Loop out in Stokes. I'm gonna scroll down, look at faces. Has anybody hiked the Blue Mountain Loop or at least heard of it? Give me a, uh, see one person shaking, no. Has anybody heard of the Blue Mountain? No, okay. Yes, I well, love it. You, someone loves it, okay, good. Well, for those of you who haven't heard of it, um, the Blue Mountain Loop is in Stokes State Forest and it is relatively new. So this is a sign that was put out by Stokes State Forest. And there were a lot of little trails in Stokes that were kind of disconnected so you could hike an out and back to another one but then there'd be no connector and you'd have to double back again and maybe form a half loop for bushwhacking to get through it and the area was just not very conducive as a hiking network so what the park did was they looked at the map and all of the lines that are just blue like those pale blue lines connecting the colored segments they built those new sections to form one big loop out of lots of little existing trails and then over the course of a few months, they phased in the new blazing. So there was one giant loop. And the idea was ultimately that you'd have overnight campsites on the Northern and the Southern part or the Eastern and Western part so that anybody could do this loop as a nice weekend overnight. And it was kind of a revolutionary idea to take what was on the ground, wipe the slate clean and make a more intuitive, logical, easy to follow trail network out of that. So I worked with the park superintendent who had that idea and we, we discussed and looked at some other ways that we could apply that elsewhere. And the test was this Vista Loop Trail. And the Vista Loop is now in Ramapo Valley County Reservation. And before we went to tackle this on the ground, we, the first step is a solicit input. So there's a few groups that you should talk to before considering any changes to a trail network. The first is of course the land manager. If there's a park, and the land manager says, this might be a superintendent or a county employee. And if they say right off the bat, nope, we're not interested. There's reasons we have that we can't even consider changes. Then that's it. That's where the issue ends because ultimately the trail conference 
works in conjunction with these land managers and ultimately we work for them and we're accountable to, to what they need. Next step would be talking to local friend groups and conservancies. So in our case, this would be the trail conference as the, the dominant friends group for most of these parks. Volunteers are always the best source of information. They're the ones who walk these trails. They bump into the lost hikers. They know where people get confused. They know where the vandalism happens. So volunteers are a critical part of any of these discussions. And local search and rescue can also be an enormous asset because they're the ones who are responding to people who are seriously lost, potentially injured. And they can usually tell you exactly where that person got lost and why they wound up in danger in the first place. And then hikers too. If you've got the time and the ability to go out and just watch people walk and wait to see who comes up to you saying they're lost, or if you see visibly lost people ask, where are you trying to go? Can you show me on this map the route you wanna do? And figure out where they wanna to get to and how the trail network can better work for them. So here is the Ramapo Valley County Reservation trail map circa 2014. So who is familiar with this park? I'm looking at the faces again. Who's hiked Ramapo Reservation? All right, here's more yeses than Stokes. Okay, good. So the original trail network had two major issues. First one was the long distance trails, the green trail here and the orange trail. Both of those went on for, I think, over close to or over a dozen miles each. Actually, not quite that much for the orange, but they're both pretty long trails. And hikers would frequently park down to the reservation, get on one of these trails, assume it was a loop, and they would wind up in an adjacent park. So if you followed the orange, you would leave Bergen County land and wind up in Ramapa Mountain State Forest. And if you followed the green trail, you would continue walking north northwest until you went, wound up in Ringwood. So both the county parks and the state parks frequently told me that they were getting people who were confused, lost, you know, thirsty, dehydrated, hungry, because they had gone out for what they thought would be a few miles in a little loop, and they wound up 10 miles away in a different park. So this was a good test subject. We identified four major hiker destinations. So when anybody comes to the reservation, you ask them, what do you want to go do? Where do you want to, um, you know, relax, have lunch? What are you going to see? They almost, without exception, said, I want to go to Hawk Rock. I want to go to the New York skyline overlook, which is the star in the middle in the blue trail. They wanted to go up to the reservoir to sit by the water or the bottom circle along the orange trail is a waterfall. People want to go sit by the waterfall. So we identified those four spots that people wanted to get to. With that in mind, we realized the contours are actually pretty amenable to adding new connector trails. So we built two short new connectors. And with those in place, we were able to just change colors and make the trail network look like this. So all of this was done by volunteers with nothing more than a jug of paint and a paintbrush. That was it. No expensive crews, no long-term projects, no breaking rocks, just volunteers and paintbrushes. And, and this new system provides three main loops that served pretty much all the hiker needs. The first is the Vista Loop, and this probably 70 plus percent of the people who come to the reservation want an experience like this one, unless they're going to just walk around the pond at the bottom. It is a small loop, it's contained, it takes you to pretty much every main destination in the park, and it spits you back out right where you started so you can go back to your car. For people who want to get away from the crowds, maybe have what feels like more of a backcountry hike where they won't see as many people, they simply do the blue loop, which takes you up on along a ridge and gets you away from the crowds. And then for people who wanted to do an expanded loop using the reservoir, the pink reservoir loop, they can also use the red to make it a bigger hike if they want. So you can see left and right the before and after of what this trail network looked like. And in addition, we, we did add signage every point where you leave a loop on the Vista loop. So you're hiking yellow. If you're going to turn left to potentially follow the blue trail or the green trail, this sign will say Ridge Trail or you know Ringwood State Park, five miles. And then it'll always point parking lot, 0 0.3 miles, so that nobody could ever, unless they were really trying hard, leave that loop and wind up going doing something that they didn't want to do. And the outcome here was that it was very successful. The park manager, um, he's no longer working for the county, so I can say he took me out for beers afterwards. And his exact words were, you gave me my weekends back. And he was so grateful because he said for he'd been working there for, I think, 30 plus years. And he said, you know, before this, my Sunday was always you wake up and you deal with the lost hikers. Because there's always going to be somebody when it's, you know, hiking weather who has gone out and either spent the night out there or search and rescue had to go get them. So he said, after we did these changes, 
it almost disappeared overnight. People were not getting lost anymore, and all we did was change a few colors. So that was a pretty incredible success story. So after that, we did a little debrief, and this was myself and again the volunteer leaders who were involved in this planning process. And we said, let's document the things that worked, all the brainstorms we had, the ideas we discarded, what we ultimately went with, so that in the future we can do this again without having to you know, reinvent the wheel. So best practices. And this is not the first time people tried to determine a few standardized trail processes. There's an article from 1931 that someone directed me to, which actually I think is the first that I could find documented conversation about blazing standardization. So this is a, a very low resolution scan from the actual hard copy archival material from the trail conference office. But it reads about this first process in 1931 that there was a spirit of harmony and a willingness to subordinate individual ideas to the general good, which promised well for future cooperation as to colors indicating general directions between terminals, red for east-west, blue for north-south, and yellow for diagonal. And I actually went back to trails that were built shortly after this, or blazed shortly after this, and in the Catskills, you can still see remnants of this uh, methodology where uh, red trails are east-west, blue are north-south, and yellow are diagonal. And then I went back to trail maps from the 1930s, 40s, 50s, of even down here in Ramapo Mountain State Forest, and you could see some of the earlier trails that were built there followed the same convention. So for a while, there was an attempt to have these standards. And over time, they fell out of use as trail networks got denser and more different groups got involved. So what we're trying to discuss in this presentation is not super radical. The idea for having good practices has always been there. And I need to emphasize that these are not mandates. This is not being handed down as the correct answer on how to do anything. But these are guidelines that we're now using at the trail conference to shape recommendation and which other people might find helpful. And for each one of the things we say, there are countless reasons why that may not be the right solution for a spot. And the only constant is always to know the trails, know the users, and keep those in mind before blindly following any of the instructions or recommendations that follow. So starting with the simplest one is loops. For most people, loops are the preferred trail type. So I'm gonna do a little face survey here. Who, nod your head if you prefer loops to out and backs. Like when you're planning a hike, who wants to do loop hikes? I see, all right, hands up, nodding. Yes, yeah, absolutely. A absolutely, yeah. So most people I talk to, they know right off the bat, they wanna plan a loop hike. And another thing in favor of loop hikes is that significant end-to-end -end hikes often require at least two vehicles because you have gotta run a shuttle. And that can be impossible for people who are hiking alone or hiking as a family with one vehicle. So loop hikes really do make it easier for more people to access a trail and have a good experience. Some exceptions like urban trails. So the Lenape Trail, for example, where people are getting to trailheads on buses or trains, loops may not be as critical. So that's the first convention is loops wherever possible. Next is the idea of the loop bisect. So when a loop gets too long, you can run into problems because maybe somebody sets off to hike the loop and then they started their hike late and next thing they know it's getting dark and you know they might say i want to i don't want to double back and go back to my car this way but i don't have enough time to complete the loop so if you build in a little bisect just so that people have the option of doing a short half day hike or a longer full day hike it adds a lot of utility to the trail network and for our purposes we've been kind of settled on a neutral color like silver to show that if you want to do the red trail you follow the red blaze and if you want to do half the red trail you follow the half red blaze and people seem to understand that pretty quickly. Another exception here, if you've got a bisect that's part of another trail, you might want to co-align or share some colors. Trailhead connectors, this is one that was really built on anecdotes from a few different hikers. So this says that trailhead connectors or spur trails should be blazed the same as the loop they're connecting to, but with a black dot in the middle. And let me show you how this helps lend clarity. So this is a really rough kind of caricature of a loop trail near me that I enjoy hiking, um, the Manaticut Point Loop. And the Manaticut Point Loop has a short yellow spur, which connects to a long yellow loop. And I heard from at least two separate people that they had had personally experiences where they went to the Manaticut Point Trail, hiked the loop, came back, and then they were confronted with a three-way intersection. All three of the trail legs are yellow, and they couldn't remember which one led back to their car. So they kind of say, well, 50-50 chance, flip a coin. And of course, they wouldn't be telling the story unless they had made the wrong decision. 
So these people wound up doing the loop again because they didn't know that they weren't on the spur back to their car. And it, while it was funny because these people were relatively experienced and they came out fine, you can easily imagine how somebody at the end of a long day, they're tired, both of the trails look the same, they wind up missing their car and go in the wrong direction. And not only is that you know, uncomfortable, but it can be frightening for people who are having an early trail experience. So the simple solution is just put some black dots. You can easily remember black leads to pavement. Um, you know that the red spur is leading to a red loop, but the black dots indicating a spur help keep people on track. And also, if you're lost and you bump into a, a trail with black dots, you know that it's going to take you out to a parking lot or a trailhead where you can get assistance. So for safety and convenience, it's just a good idea. And of course, an exception would be you don't want to have a spur trail with dots that long. That's <laughs> that would be a nightmare to blaze. I think all the volunteers and regions would throttle me if I suggested this to them and <laughs> the extra work that would create. So. If something's a long spur, then it's probably worth being a different color in its own merits. Next one is parking lots. Kind of, we talked about loops earlier, and wherever possible, whenever someone parks somewhere, there should be a nice, easy loop you can recommend right off the parking lot, whether or not there's a spur that goes to it or the loop goes right to the lot itself. And sometimes you've got restrictions with topography, you might not have enough room to make a viable loop. And that's okay, but in a perfect world, every parking lot, every trailhead would have a convenient loop option. Next, long distance trails. So a lot of trail networks have long distance trails and whether that's long distance on a small kind of interpark scale like the Hewitt Butler Trail or genuine long distance trails like the Appalachian Trail. But whenever these long trails pass through um, trail networks, it's helpful if the resources are there to have some signage to determine which way is north, which way is south, or east and west. Because um, I've definitely had that happen where someone wanted to follow the Hewitt Butler Trail. They knew in their mind they wanted to get to the Hewitt Butler Trail. They intersected it, but they turned left instead of right on it. And they just followed the long distance trail until they got to the wrong <laughs> south end of the park when they were trying to get to the north end. So if the resources are there, a simple directional sign at the intersection is, is a big help. So these are instances in this trail network where you might want to have signs if you can. Others, trail connectors. Whenever you've got a short trail connector, you wanna to try to avoid having the same duplicated color. And this is true for any trail network. You don't wanna have two orange trails. I'm gonna keep going back to Northern Green because I love the park, but it was not the most brilliant in terms of blazing when I first encountered it. I was talking early in my trail conference career to someone who was lost and over the phone, I was asking them, well, where did you park? You know, you're lost, let's backtrack. And they said, I'm in Northern Green and I'm following the yellow trail. I parked at the trailhead with the yellow trail. And I looked at the map and both the north parking lot and the southern parking lot had yellow trails. They were different yellow trails, but they had been blazed the same color. So for the life of me, I could not get this person to remember the name of the road they parked on, whether it was north or south. They All they knew was they parked the yellow trail and they were mad at me for being so confused. <laughs> so going forward, the internalized lesson was if you can avoid duplicating colors within the same park, that's probably a good practice. Instead, for short connectors, often these little trails, they have no real purpose on their own. They simply exist to connect other trails. And to make them intuitive and clear, if you've got a little trail that only exists to connect the red to the blue, why not blaze it half red and half blue? That way people feel confident they know they're going in the right direction to connect the two trails they want. Co-alignment. Um, you remember the blazes I showed a, a few slides ago at Stoke State Forest where it was the blue to the blue to the gray to the turquoise or teal? We want to try to avoid that. Um, people call them totem pole trees sometimes where you've got three, four, sometimes five different colors in the same tree and that's not ideal. That can be more confusing than helpful. So we want to try to min minimize any co-alignment if we can. And if, there might be some exceptions like say in this map, say most people for some reason hiked from parking lot in the north to the parking lot in the south, and it was very popular, it was historic, then you might want to keep it if you knew there was local demand, but typically if you can avoid it, try not to have needless co-alignment. We also don't want to have redundant trails, so sometimes here maybe, and this, this still exists, we're actually looking at one spot in particular where there are two trails that actually crisscross and run within 200 feet of each other, there's no need to have two trails, particularly if one trail was there first and it was really muddy and really poor condition and a new trail was built to replace it but they never closed the old one you need to keep in mind that most people who are hiking with a map they may not have 
walked on these trails before. And if you've got two trails on the map getting to the same place, one's enjoyable and one's miserable, we want people to have enjoyable experiences. So let's make sure that everything that's on the ground is gonna be something they can enjoy. And of course here, some trails look close on a map, but it might be that maybe the green trail is at the base of a cliff and the red silver is on top of a cliff. In that case, if they're radically different and more far apart than they look, then of course you wanna preserve that. And I think this is about the last one, but designated uses. And this is a really probably the toughest one in practice, but in a perfect world, as much as possible, we wanna to move towards, if a trail is blazed as one trail, as one color, it should be very clear to users what's allowed and what's not allowed there. It's difficult if you've got a trail that's maybe an accessible trail up to a certain ambiguous point and it stops being accessible, or if you've got a trail that's hiker only, but after a certain point, mountain bikers are allowed. And that's, that's not fair to any of the users on the ground. So we wanna to try to make things as clear as possible in the trail design. And like I mentioned here, if you've got a trail that was designed as an accessible trail, but all of a sudden it drops off a cliff, like there are certain things you can't avoid no matter how much you build. So in that case, interpretation, signage, and setting user expectations at the trailhead is important so that people aren't disappointed, confused, or put in danger by situations they're not ready for. All right, so I saw a few things popping up in the comments. I'm gonna take a break here to read through the comments and see if any questions have popped up. All right, so oh, someone did the Blue Mountain Loop today, so that's great, very topical. Um, Keith likes two car hikes, that's fantastic. So that, that can be done even with loops, but like we said, it's not something that everybody can do. Uh, okay, and someone had to leave early, so great. Well, it seems like no big questions right now. Does anybody have anything they want clarified before we move on to kind of the end points? All right. I don't see anybody, no raised hands, no comments. All right, so let's go back into the presentation. All right, sorry about that. Here we go, share screen. And we're back in. Can everybody see again? I think, all right, everyone yeah. looks like they're pretty engaged, good. All right, so this is where I think things get really interesting. Now, before this, we were talking about kind of in a vacuum, what are the best practices? What are things we should strive for? But as soon as your plan makes contact with the enemy, you realize that nothing's as simple as you think in a vacuum. So each of those earlier best practices that we listed make, might make sense at the time when you're behind your desk being all intellectual and cerebral about this. But as soon as you hit the trail and start scouting, you might realize things don't make sense. So we're going to take the same configuration on the right. This is the one that we sort of discussed leading up to this point. And we're going to look at some different options using that same trail layout. And you can see a little star just popped up just for conversation. Let's pretend that's a nice vista or a point of interest. So the one on the left makes a lot of sense if you've got trails of different uses. So maybe the blue trail is a hiking only trail and the red trail is a multi-use one that's built suitable for mountain bikers and hikers. So if you do that, you can still clarify the system a little bit. So take a look on the left. If you wanted to get to the star from the north parking lot, you would have to go blue trail spur to the left on the blue, to the left on the blue red, to the right on the red, to the left on the blue, or on the red silver. And that's a little more complicated than we want for a destination. We assume a lot of people are gonna park up north and wanna get there. So on the right, all we've done is change a few colors. And instead it simply says you park up north, follow the blue spur, left on the blue, then you follow the blue red. And there you are, you've made it. And that blue red connector also is pretty intuitive because it connects the blue loop to the red loop. So that's a very simple little way to clarify that trail network potentially and make sure that visitors from both ends can easily get to the viewpoint. How about this? This way, instead of having a separate destination spur, what if we just co aligned the blue loop with the red like this? It's the exact same network, nothing's changed on the ground. And if anything, we can eliminate that blue trail section, which you see, which is crossed out in gray now. So we have actually maybe closed down a trail that might've been redundant or unsustainable. And we've made trail networks where no matter where you park, no matter where you access from, you've got pretty much a one color hike that does a loop, takes you to the main destination, and then right back to your car. Again, no new trail construction, just simply changing colors on the ground to make things more effective. 
Let's look at another option. There we go, stacked loops. And stacked loops is a hiking term where you've got large loop options that have these smaller um, kind of, you know, cut throughs. So it allows people to really build their own challenge. So say you're a new hiker, you could start with the blue trail we know is easier, the red trail loop is more difficult. You can start on blue and you can use that little um, shortcut to do a half blue loop. Then you come out next weekend, you do the full blue loop. You're feeling more confident, so you do the more difficult section. You do half the red loop, and then you graduate to the full red loop. By that point, you're probably confident using maps, you're used to the trail network, and for the grand finale, if you want, you can do a, you know, a hike that combines the red and the blue to make one really big loop by going up from the southern parking lot, follow the red onto the blue, then back onto the red to complete your loop. So this trail network really provides an easy way for people to pick a, a simple loop that's right for them, and as they get more experience, to graduate to larger and larger loops. And again, all of those, every option we just looked at, uses the exact same footprint on the ground, exact same route. So all of those very significant changes for the users and for access, for navigation, are all paintbrush and paint bucket jobs. And here's another really great tool, which my friends at Jorba, so the Jersey Off-Road Biking Association, organization, sorry, nope, association, it's an A. <laughs> so Jorba, um, I will say I'm a bit of a Luddite myself, and mountain bikers tend to be a demographic that really is kind of ahead of the curve in terms of technology. So I was introduced to an app called Strava, which is used by hikers, bikers, runners, to collect their user information so that they can compare, um, work to improve, or almost compete with other athletes and outdoor enthusiasts. And the heat map that results from this is simply showing where people's activity overlaps. And the more overlap you have in a section, the brighter it appears. So this is the same section of trail map, which is Southern Northern Green. And this is what it looks like if you look at it through Strava. And immediately you can see some trail segments are so dark that they almost disappear. Those dark red, almost maroon purple ones. And some are white hot, which means they get lots and lots of views. And just at a glance, by taking the Strava data and comparing it to the trail map, you can say, it looks like most people are hiking this network as loops, either smaller loops up there or a larger loop that incorporates, I think that's the Otter Hole Trail. So it gives some really good um, perception and insight into how people are using the trails. And our goal, I think, as an organization shouldn't be just to keep doing the same thing over and over again or defending things that don't work because they've always been that way. I think as the trail conference, we need to look at trail users, what keeps them safest, what keeps them happiest, and what makes the most sense for them. So this is a great way to, to innovate and improve. And what I've done is sometimes take these maps and use Photoshop and with a transparency overlay, drop the Strava map right on top of the trail map. And that A, um, shows us where trails are being used, but B, in addition, you can see sometimes if there are illegal trails that are being used or unmaintained things or often you'll see woods roads that get more use than blaze trails. And maybe that indicates that those should be marked. If people are really using them, we can better serve the public by having those trails be part of the formal network. So it's a very useful tool. And there you go for just to be easier to see. Those are the most popular trails as identified by Strava. Now the latest, this is where it gets very topical and recent. So Northern Green State Forest, the one I kept mentioning, is having, again, kindly a few challenges when I first encountered it. We decided to take a look at the trail and see what could we do to make it easier to navigate. Because talking to search and rescue and talking to the state parks, they both said that this area sees relatively little use by hikers, or it did at the time. But despite that, it showed a disproportionate amount of lost and confused hikers. So clearly there were some problems there. So I looked at the map and said, here's all the things I can see that look like challenges. First thing you can see on the top, there's a convenient loop, the burnt meadow in yellow and the loop that is formed around that. But in order to do that very simple convenient loop, you have to follow five different colors for one tiny loop. Next, you can see in the middle of the map, there is a nice network of woods roads and unmaintained trails, but there's no formal connectivity. So if people want to connect the north to south part, they've kind of got a bushwhack and leave marked trails to make the way on their own and that's probably why people are getting, getting lost. Next we have the blue Hewitt Butler Trail and it was sort of a long distance trail at one point but it's since been severed so it no longer connects the towns of Hewitt and Butler like it once did and talking to hikers looking at Strava almost nobody hiked it as a long distance trail people were not using it in its original purpose 
And I believe when I talk to some people about the history of it, a lot of trails like these at one point did connect public transit options. So you might have a train station or a bus stop on one end. So it made a lot of sense when those existed for people to take a bus, get off, hike the trail, then take a bus home. However, in the intervening years, a lot of those bus stations and uh, bus stops, train stations have all closed down. So the trails no longer serve a practical purpose. They've kind of become nostalgic relics, but there's no sense in actually hiking them as they were originally intended. So people were getting confused because they'd get on the blue trail and just follow it until it just dead ended down at the bottom. Next, we've got on the upper right, there's a white trail that a lot of people use mostly as a spur trail to get to the long distance Highlands Trail, but there was nothing on the trailhead or in the blazing to indicate that's where it led. So it was a little tricky. <clears throat> and finally, on the bottom, another popular loop hike going to Lake Sonoma, but involved a bunch of different blaze colors. I think here it was, yeah, four different colors. So again, not super user friendly. <clears throat> so this was the first revision. The first thing we did was try to get, as we said earlier, one loop from each parking area. So the northern loop is green, southern loop was yellow. The yellow's got a nice little bisect. If you want to do a shorter version of the hike, maybe just using Manatiket Point in the southeast. There was also a white loop, so people could hike the yellow, incorporate the white to make a larger trail uh, loop, and then come back along the yellow. So even using just two colors, you could do a hike that was a decent number of miles. So that was the first revision. Next, the park said that they'd be very open to us using existing woods roads. And if we just blaze those, we could go ahead and incorporate those into the network as well without a really thorough environmental review because they were already on the ground. <clears throat> so we looked at putting almost a X shape or a cross in the middle, um, blazing existing trails except for one little bit by Burnt Meadow uh, wetlands on the western part. And those little connections opened up two full new loops. And you can see a lot of different new permutations for loop hikes that incorporate no more than two colors. And then finally, again, in some rather heated at some points negotiations with our volunteers and discussing, you know, uh, um, different uses in the trail network, it made a lot of sense. And the park manager wanted to have jungle habitat, which is a multi-use trail network, incorporated into the larger state park. So we decided to have a multi-use trail network that ran down using woods roads, came back up and formed a loop that would be suitable for all users. And this is, I think this was a really great conversation and we did a lot of scouting on the ground between trail conference and Jorba volunteers. And it was really nice to see that we can have conversations and discussions about moving forward in a way that isn't too black and white. So this is the ultimate thing that the park wanted to see on the ground. And again, a before and after, you can see on the left, not a lot of connectivity, not a single loop hike option except for the little yellow loop. And by the way, the yellow loop on the bottom, that's the one I mentioned where people were coming to that three-way intersection and going home <laughs> back towards the lake. Versus on the right, all of a sudden the trail network, every parking area has got a loop option. There's lots of different ways you can connect loops to make um, a simple two-color expanded loop depending on what you want to see, where you want to go, how much time you have. and if you're ever lost, you just simply follow the color you started on and it'll take you back to your car. So no more spending the night in Northern Green. All right, and let me stop sharing for a second. Any questions or comments have popped up then? Ah, Keith clarified, thank you, Keith. Said, in this case, Hewitt Butler was two train stations. So I mentioned bus stops or train stations. So in this example, uh, train stations were the original intent there. Any other questions? We're, we're getting right to the end now. Question, please, Peter. This is yes, Phil. go ahead. Um, so, can you talk at all about the issues that when you re do all this replacing, some people will still have old maps and mm -hmm. talk about those problems, please? Yeah, absolutely. And that was actually the last section I was going to talk about was anticipated, um, you know, pushback to this idea and challenges that might arise. And that was one that was a big concern at first for both of these projects, Ramapo and Northern Green. Some volunteers who'd been working particularly a long time in the area said lots of people have been coming here for years. They know the trails as they are, and they're going to be confused when the trails have changed. Or maybe people are hiking for the first time and they have an outdated map, and they're going to be confused because the trail won't match. And the way we addressed that was having laminated um, signs that went up at every trail intersection and every trailhead that was affected. And they showed on the left, here's the old trail network, and on the right, here's the new one. So be aware in particular, you know, the yellow loop takes you around and back here. And so we tried our best to head it off by doing that. 
And I personally, I didn't hear a single issue with people being confused or upset or lost with the changes. We got a lot of compliments from people who said they've been hiking for years and having the loop made it more enjoyable or it took them to places they hadn't thought to explore before. And I think what it boils down to is the people who know enough to notice the changes already know the trails well enough. They're not going to get lost. I, if someone says, I've been hiking here for 30 years, and I say, well, I'm not worried about you. You know how to handle it. You know where you, know, where, where you like to hike. So you're not going to get lost. The people who have maps, generally the changes, you know, there are marked intersections. And even if the colors on the map were a little wrong, people didn't seem to have any trouble recognizing that changes had been made. Really, the people who used to be getting lost were the ones who had no map and no experience. And all of these changes were designed specifically to suit their needs. The people who had no maps, no experience. So in both cases, in Northern Green, we heard the same thing from the park manager that lost hikers and complaints dropped significantly after we did that. So now, right now we're batting two for two successes in New Jersey with this. But yeah, I'm, to be entirely honest, I thought it was inevitable that we would get more, <laughs> more confusion or more complaints. And I was surprised and delighted when we didn't actually get that input. All right, so we've got Jorge is asking, what about having simple maps at the main parking lot for first time hikers and invite them to leave the map at the end of their hike? So yeah, in some areas we do have little boxes where we have printout maps and flyers that show the area. The challenge is those things need to be re restocked constantly. Um, they tend to fly off, land on the trail, the boxes get wet and damp and moldy, and the volunteers in charge of those parks really have a full-time job keeping them filled up. So we have done it. And in areas where we have easy to access trailheads and volunteers who want to do that, then we absolutely do have paper maps. But very recently in New Jersey, we've done a much better job of having permanent trailhead map signs. And in the past, the trailhead map sign material was this very expensive, very rugged, sold as you know UV resistant, weatherproof, anodized aluminum or a fiberglass composite. And it could cost $200 to put up a map sign made of these materials. So if you ever change the trail, good luck getting the map replaced. You'd have to go on a two year budget cycle to get the money to replace the map. So what we've been doing recently is using lawn sign material, which is corrugated PVC with weatherproof ink on it. And those seem to have held up very well and they're very cheap. So whenever we do these changes, all you have to do is go to Staples. Within a week, they'll print out the new maps and you can just go out and replace the maps at the trailhead. So that updating technology, simply having maps that are easy to update, easy to replace, has made projects like these a lot more feasible. So currently for New Jersey state parks, most trailhead kiosks do currently have up-to-date maps and they've got QR codes for free map downloads and people can photograph them. So, so Jorge, yes, so in addition to the handout maps, we do have better trailhead maps now. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, digital maps um, from Rob Bond asking um there are challenges with digital maps is there any strategy to using those so with new jersey we're lucky and i'm sorry i'm focusing on new jersey a lot because that's where these particular stories are coming from but new jersey recreational trails program gave the trail conference a grant several years ago which enabled us to create free digital maps for most new jersey state parks where we maintain so all the trailhead kiosks have print maps and each one also has a qr code and a link to download a free map of the area so these have been great for people who are first time hikers. And in many cases, we've had lost hikers call the trail conference office. And it's an amazing change with the technology because now what we tell people is, do you have a smartphone? Okay, if you have a smartphone, download this and then call us back. And without fail, every single one of them has said, oh, I downloaded it, it shows me where I am. I'm good, thank you. And they hang up and they can self rescue. There were times back before I started sharing that information because I, I, it took me honestly a year and a half to even download the digital maps myself. <laughs> I came from a background doing real backcountry trail building and river guiding. So I thought having a smartphone map was ridiculous. But once I finally agreed to look at it and try it out, it really is a game changer. And it's not only helped from a trail planning perspective, but in terms of helping people self rescue and deal with confusing trail networks, the, the apps are a really good supplement to paper maps. Not a replacement, but they're a good supplement. All right, so it is almost 7.30, so we're right on track. Let's get to the last part of this presentation. All right, can everybody see? Good, there's the nods, all right. So for implementation, 
we were saying before, it's fine to be theoretical and design these trail networks. You know, I can sit on Photoshop all day and draw all the squiggly colors I want. But if other people don't get on board and we don't really do the field work and on the ground checking, then there's, there's no point and there's no way to implement these. So the first thing that we've been encountering um, when presenting these is kind of just knee-jerk reaction, which is understandable. I don't say knee-jerk in a demeaning way, but people have been saying, if this works, why would we change an established trail, especially something that's historic or it's long distance? Why do you want to come in and just change things for no reason? So that's one thing we get. And some solutions to that kind of resistance might be maintaining existing trails as co-aligned. So say, for example, the local volunteer leaders were adamant that they wanted the Hewitt Butler preserved. They knew it wasn't used. They knew that people weren't hiking it, but for historic reasons, they wanted it to stay on the ground. You can always come to a compromise and say, okay, we'll have it as a co-aligned trail. So the Hewitt Butler will still be there. We won't touch the blazes, but we might add a little bit of co-aligned stuff for local loops that utilize it. And that's usually been received well. Another option for other areas is to have a digital hike. So you might have something on the trail conference website that says historic Hewitt Butler trail to follow this trail as it was laid out in whatever year you start on this trail, go to this trail, go to the next one. And that will digitally walk you through the loop and it'll preserve the route in perpetuity as part of kind of online records and archives. Another question we get, particularly from the park partners, is they're usually very in favor of all the work on the ground but they get a little nervous about budgets and they say, well, new maps and new signs, they cost money. Our next budget cycle for printing is in two years. When do you want to do this? And the you know, money's always on their mind. So one thing that we can do is work with them to say, all right, when is your next routine map reprinting? And we'll just hold off on the changes until it coincides with that. So no need to change your plan, no need to change your budget. We'll work with you to make the timing work for everybody. The other thing is if we're seeking grants for projects, when we write those grants to make sure that incorporated into that is the budgetary cost of maps and signage and say, as part of this trail work, we also need to do some back end digital or print work to make sure it's clear to everybody. And those are the two main challenges and they've both been handled really well. So in the plans that we have coming up, even in the trail conference, we have our own map printing cycle. So our cartographer, Jeremy Afgar, gave our volunteers the timeline for the next map set that would be affected by changes. And our volunteers are making sure we do the work by that deadline so that the maps are accurate when they come out. And that's really it. Um, that was kind of brief on the challenges and obstacles, but does anybody have any questions about things they'd like to learn more about? And the hope here is that from now on, when you look at a trail map or you plan a hike, to start thinking about, oh man, like I always do the same loop. Wouldn't it make sense if this were just placed as a loop? Or there are certain parks that maybe you're a volunteer and you maintain and you find every single person you bump into is walking the same loop that's made up of five different trails, or you know the intersections where people get lost and you have ideas for improving it, what can you do to make it clearer? So. Peter? Yes. Yeah. Um, are there any discussions with um, some of the New York parks like in Harriman and East Hudson to apply this methodology? That's a great question. And um, in my new trail program manager role, part of my job is to have best practices and ideas cross the border. In our previous structure with regional program coordinators, it, you know, sometimes a good idea might stay in one park or in one region. So I have brought this up to New York Parks, to PIPC and OPRHP, and some of the park staff have been very interested in this, and they do want to meet and talk and look at particularly Harriman, which having looked at the maps and having hiked it myself, I know can be a warrant of short trails and connectors and spurs. So absolutely, yes, it is on the table as soon as COVID craziness stops and we all have a little more breathing space. Uh, we would like to talk about some of these ideas for New York. All right, now the questions are pouring in good. The floodgate is opened. So someone asks, how can we find out if hikers are having issues or getting lost on the trail I maintain? And that's something if people are getting lost or they have feedback about a trail, they'll often email the trail conference office and whenever we get those messages, we send those directly to the relevant supervisor. So whether that's the trail chair or the trail supervisor, and if there's something that can be done to fix it, the supervisor is probably the best situated to pass on that information. Next question. Um, what are some of the reasons why lay managers refuse changes? That is a good one. I think a lot of it has to do with 
And I love, I say this loving my park management partners. And it's sometimes you have to disentangle the park managers who are on the ground who you work with, with kind of the back end state bureaucracy. And I think one of the challenges I mentioned earlier is maps. And in the past, often parks didn't have their own dedicated professional maps. They kind of relied on the trail conference and other friends groups to make maps. So back then it was much easier to get changes through. Now all of a sudden every trail that um, change that's done needs to go down to Trenton or up to Albany. Sometimes, even if there's nothing changing, just colors, they might want to trigger an environmental review. There might be, if they're printing their own maps, they might say our next budget cycle for map printing is in three years. So we're scared to change anything before then. Sometimes just simply they have the same, the same thoughts that anybody else would have, which is it's worked this well, why would we change it? And those are all things that I've encountered in different degrees. Um, but all of them were eventually we came to resolutions and unanimously the park managers afterwards said it truly is better now. Like we are seeing lost hikers and we're glad that you talked us into this pretty much because I can be a little persistent sometimes. And I think that's the reason why I had the state park superintendent co-present this because he was one of the people I had to persuade. And luckily he's a fantastic partner. He came on board pretty quickly and he became such a strong proponent that he wanted to help co-present it to a larger audience. So land managers have largely been a, a delight to work with. Keith shares hand is raised. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say that um, I like the presentation tonight, having currently gone through this whole process now in the middle of it. Um, I like how it incorporates the history of the trail conference and looking forward into how I'm making it better for hikers. Um, it's, it's the way I look at my own trails. I'm a curmudgeon for historic trails. Um, I'm always scouring eBay for the old New York walk books. Uh, and I have my Hofferlin map set that I've found and put together. So I appreciate the old and I like looking at it in a new way. And just hiking this weekend, on my trails and seeing all the new hikers mm -hmm. who you know white claw in hand were having a great time um but you know they they don't know where they are and you know i think this is going to go a long way to helping them on my own trails and in other parks and i think it's just a great idea i'm yeah. glad to be part of it and Keith is a trail conference supervisor and Keith and I have been deep in discussion the past few months about these exact kind of changes in his area. So I don't want to blow the top on any surprises, Keith, but I know we'll be working together shortly, I'm sure, for some trail walker articles so you can reveal to the world what we've been doing behind the curtain. Absolutely. And of course, behind the curtain, I mean, with the relevant volunteer committees and park managers and trail conference staff. So <laughs> no, no renegade trails here. Okay, and if that's it, it is, let's see what time, just past 7.30. So we stayed within, you know, that hour mark for the presentation. And if anybody has any questions, you can always contact me. Um, my email address is just pdolan, my name's pdolan, at New York, New Jersey Trail Conference org, And you'll get a follow-up email to this presentation, which has the whole thing in its entirety as a PDF. So you can go back and review it if you want, or maybe take some ideas and compare them to trails where you hike or where you work. And it's also going to have the introductory thing I had on the screen, which was the blank trail network. So you can always print it out as an activity and just kind of brainstorm and get used to using some of these ideas and as you do planning. So great. Hope you all enjoyed. That's it and have a great evening. Thank you, Peter. It's a pleasure. Thank you all. I see let's replace high mountain, someone says that. <laughs> Brian I'm that's, for you. <laughs> yeah, high mountain needs it. There's that talk about a challenging place. Yeah. Probably about twenty five percent are always lost. Yeah, yep. Great. Well, I'm gonna close the presentation. So have a good night, everyone. <laughs>